Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And you know what? I am only going to talk about what is important to the XRP holder. And trust me, I know what that is. And I'm going to begin with talking about Brianne Madigan's article. And I think it's very important to understand if you really want to fully understand XRP and on-demand liquidity or ODL, as I will often go in and out because they all mean the same. So if you're new to this space, don't get confused. When I say using XRP or ODL or on-demand liquidity, it all means the same. All right, market makers. This is so important to understand that they are a key component to the ecosystem and they make their money on arbitrage. Because XRP has low transaction fees, has speed, has reliability, it's ideal for the market maker. Even in a volatile market, it can quickly service that customer who wants to use XRP as a bridge. So the fast settlement helps them manage the risk of the moving price, whether it's moving up or moving down. And the most important thing to understand is that ODL, on-demand liquidity, needs market makers in order to work efficiently. So let's go back to 2013. And I wanna show you how it has been all the way back at this time when we see a presentation that had 148 pages. I'm on slide 112. They were promoting arbitrage so that they could attract more market makers to the space. So arbitrage, as you see in this particular slide, is the buying and selling of the same digital asset. And it's done at almost the same time. And that market maker will take a profit from the difference in price. That is known as the spread. And this is how market makers make their living. Market making for XRP makes large payments possible, and it also makes the liquidity efficient. And if I take you to the Ripple Insights page a couple of years later to 2015, you can see this is an article about the life of a market maker. And it's kind of fun because there was a guy by the name of Anthony Milas. He was a musician in New Zealand and he was market making on Ripple, which started out first as just a curious hobby, but it developed into something more substantial. And he was able to take advantage of that arbitrage in the market that was growing very fast. And he earned in the high seven figures of XRP. I wonder if he's still holding. He started out with only just 1,000 XRP. So they put this article out because they, at this time, were, as they are today, trying to attract more participants in that part of the ecosystem. Now, this is so interesting. This is where it gets very good. This is a podcast with David Schwartz, and it's from 2015. I don't think anybody watching this video has heard this because this channel, which actually went quiet a couple of years ago, only had 79 subscribers and there are only 255 views on this video. And I think you're gonna find it is so golden. It's an hour long, which is quite rare today to have this kind of interview uh, that goes for this length of time. So it has, a, it has three portions I'm gonna play for you. The first one is just 15 seconds long. I wanna give you an idea of where we were in this space at this time. This is fun, listen to this. Welcome to Bitcoins and Gravy, episode 54. At the time of this recording, Bitcoins are trading at $227 each, and everybody's favorite LTB coin is trading at $0.000253 US dollars each. Mm, mm, mm. So Bitcoin was trading at $227. Wow. It paid off for everybody who continued to hold. And LTB... What the heck is LTB coin trading at 0 0.000253? That shows you how small the market was. The market cap, I'm not sure exactly how large, but it was just a fraction of what it is today. Because if you have a 
very popular coin that's only trading at that price. It tells you how early on a lot of people were. Well, LTB was very much an early pioneer. I think it only lasted until 2017, but it is from the person who is uh, by the name of Adam Levine, and it is the pioneer of the BAT coin, the basic uh, attention token. And if you are kind of geeky, you want to look at this video, which I'll put down in the description below. It's from 2014. And look who's lurking in the back there. You can see Ethereum's Vitalik Buterin. And so it's really just fun. All right, getting back to this podcast, because um, there's two more sections I want you to listen to. And it's important because, um, well, you're going to see that it addresses what everybody in this space wants to know more about. All right, so we are first, let's see, I wanna make sure I'm queued up in the right spot. I have to be at the 11.58 mark, which let's see if I can do this quick and easy for you. Let's start from right here, okay? This is going to talk about arbitrage in this section. Have a listen. Offers from Ripple Trade right now. You can see order books, bids and asks. Um, there's market making going on by individuals. It's actually kind of an exciting playground. And as more and more real money moves through it, right now there's more than a million dollars a day traded on the Ripple network, live cross-currency Ooh. trades. So it's uh, an exciting playground to understand Forex markets and um, move between currencies. It's a good way to buy and sell Bitcoins. It's a good way to buy and sell XRP, Ripple's native currency. But are there any arbitrage opportunities or any opportunities unique to the Ripple protocol that would allow someone to make money once they get into the Ripple protocol? Because, you know, a lot of people that are into Bitcoin, they're just in it because they're speculators, right? Are there opportunities right now for speculators using the Ripple protocol? There's definitely opportunity for arbitrage and market making, creating liquidity. Um, there's... Okay, so I just wanted to put, put that out there because, again... They're talking about the opportunities that are there for the market makers and arbitrage. Okay, now we are going to get to the part that talks about price. And you'll understand how that all can play into the ecosystem working efficiently in the vision that has been from the get-go, how that actually plays out. And that, of course, if all the stars align. All right, I need to queue it up to the 28 minute mark. And here we are, right, right, <laughs> I'm bad at this, right there. Okay, have a listen. Not really the same as Bitcoin in terms of how the value can go up and how it's traded and all of that. Can you address the value of XRP for our listeners and for that guy? Well, obviously, it's hard to predict the future, and there's certainly no such thing as a short thing. Risk and reward always uh, come in pairs. Mm -hmm. So the thinking is that if you have a large number of currencies on the Ripple Network and a large number of institutions issuing them, it will be very difficult to find a direct path between two currencies. So if you have U.S. dollars at, you know, issued by a local chain and you want to pay somebody in Guatemala who gets cash at his grocery store, the probability that there'll be someone offering to trade one of those currencies directly for the other is pretty low and that the liquidity will probably be through some intermediary currency. Mm -hmm. The Ripple Network has a native intermediary currency called XRP or sometimes called Ripples. And the advantage of Ripples is that there is no counterparty. There's nobody... It it works just like Bitcoin. Your Ripple balance is just a number on your Ripple account on the Ripple network. And the theory is that because XRP doesn't require any trust or anything in common, it can flow between any two accounts. You don't have to agree to have somebody hold it for you. And so if that becomes the premier intermediary currency, then two types of people will want to hold XRP. One will be people who don't know what currency they'll need next. If the path from dollars to euros tends to go through XRP, then if you don't know whether you'll need dollars or euros, it makes sense to hold XRP because then you only have to pay half the spread. Mm. And then the other thing is market makers. If you're just trying to make a market and people who are selling their dollars want XRP because that's what they need to buy euros, then if you want to be able to buy dollars, XRP is the currency that you're going to need to hold to buy them. If that's the way it plays out, then the demand for XRP will go up and therefore the price will go up. Mm -hmm. All right, so there's two types of people who will want to hold XRP. And if all that 
works out, uh, the demand for XRP will go up, therefore the price will go up. So this is why the holders in this space are paying attention to the corridors that are opening uh, and, and all of the progress because this has been and will continue to be a step-by-step -step basis. However, I have been reporting on this for a long time and I can tell you it has never been more full of partnerships and people participating in the ecosystem than today. And I believe that is only going to increase over the next 12 months. So two days ago, Ripple released a new cloud solution. This is also very important for ODL. It will significantly accelerate the integration of financial institutions. And you can see here that RippleNet Cloud also makes it easy for the financial institutions to add alternative settlement through on-demand liquidity. The cloud customers can also maintain and make new connections more easily through one API for all of their RippleNet connections. So I want to look at four customers that are in the RippleNet ecosystem now. And those four are SBI with their brand new corridor using RippleNet to Vietnam. I want to look at Amnes uh, and also the very first ODL user, Mercury FX. And then, of course, I want to look at Azimo. They are an ODL uh, XRP on demand liquidity user. And we need to pay attention. We see all these headlines and then we just like, well, what's going on? Okay, so let me see if I can bring you up to date with some four that I think are very key. So with SBI, they are moving money between that corridor, between Vietnam and Japan. It's, it's very new. They just went live in November. And as of May 1st, you can see here, it was announced that the processing of remittances is in a billion yen. That's equivalent to tens of millions of US dollars. And it's being done in a matter of minutes instead of a matter of days or, or even hours for that, uh, for that point. And the TP bank, which is, this, which is the bank in, uh, Vietnam, they will use RippleNet now to open up new remittance corridors. This is important. Why? Because it's successful. Would they open up new corridors if it wasn't? Heck no. And many of these new transfer services for both individuals and corporations, they're going to focus especially on the SMEs, the small to medium size enterprises, which we all know is a true focus of Ripple right now. And it makes sense because these remittances are guaranteed for, for the most part, they're paying their suppliers, they're paying their um, partners, they're paying their employees. So you have this guaranteed monthly remittance that always comes in. It's not like just hoping that somebody out there has a little extra cash that they need to send their brother in another country to put a new roof on. No, this is, this, the SMEs create a corridor of remittances that can be forecasted on. All right. That, that's, that's a really important part. And now let's look at Ripple and Osimo. This is a partner that is using XRP, the digital asset in their corridor. And they are a transfer service that is out of um, Europe. And they're moving that money using the digital asset to the Philippines. And you can see here that they have plans to expand the use of ODL across more quarters this year. So of course, I'm one of those people who are always searching for which corridor have they brought live. So I went on to their website and you can see that it's very clear that the narrative that they use or the verbiage that they use to describe how the money is sent to the Philippines in regards to the delivery times is very specific. It will be processed immediately. It can be done 24 by seven, and it is available to pick up within one hour. So I wanted to look at all their corridors that they're focusing on. And it, I took a look at Poland. 
Do I think it's live with ODL? No, there's no words that say immediate process. There's no 24 by seven. You have to do it before 3 p.m. to even get it the next day. Um, yeah, there's no ODL. How about Bangladesh? You can see right here. No, one to two working days to move that money. What about Thailand? Unfortunately not. As you all know, I am personally really looking forward to when this corridor goes live. But unfortunately, no, one to three days, one to three working days, and it's even slower on holidays. But Nigeria, what's happening in Nigeria? Well, the same description for the delivery times is used as their ODL corridor. Yes, we have immediate processing. We have 24 by seven, and we have within 30 minutes. Do I think this corridor is live? Yes, I do. I don't speculate often, right? But allow me to speculate this time. I believe this corridor is open. We have to wait to see an official announcement, but I'm just paying attention to the specifics. And I don't think there's any coincidence that the verbiage is the same. All right, this is important to look at. This is what the CEO of Osimo said at the time the announcement was made. And the uh, this is Richard Ambrose. He said, as more banks and financial institutions use ODL, we believe it has the potential to replace current methods of foreign exchange trading to reduce settlement time to close to zero. All right, the reason why I'm bringing that one up is because I wanna talk about this third customer. This is Amnes. And Amnes is, uh, they're a client that is uh, using the RippleNet technology. And let's see, this is, I'm on XRP Arcade. This went uh, out as an announcement in February on the 26th of this year. And you can see that they're a service company that handles foreign currencies, FX, foreign exchange, and international payments. All right, so what's interesting is on the same day of their announcement, they said that yes, we are going to evaluate the use of ODL, and that's already in Q2 2020, as we are definitely uh, do see the need, as well as the benefit for our existing clients. So we're in Q2 of 2020, and I just really am trying to find out what they're doing. Amnes has raised a fresh funding round and it is uh, undisclosed the amount and I can't find who has lent them the money. Sorry, I, I really searched a lot, but I can't find that. But what I can tell you is that it's a series A round and it is for them to operate for SMEs in the processing of currency business, the risk management and international payments. And they're going to operate in 20 different currencies. And uh, this is now a company that already has 400 Swiss companies that use their platform. About 12 days ago, they advertised for a head of IT, a full stack developer. So they've got some money, so now they can add to their team. And they're growing fast, as it says, and they are going to make it easier for SMEs to handle foreign currencies and international payments via a fully automated web platform. And this is going to take them to the next phase of their growth. And four days ago, on Monday, Weirbank announced that they are gonna use and rely on Amnes for their FX transactions and international payments. So the flywheel, everybody, you think it's in effect? I do, I'd say so. This is really starting to gain some speed. All right, we're gonna to go to the fourth customer. This is the uh, 
uh, one of the original first clients that Ripple had that uses the on-demand liquidity for um, their business. So they're using XRP and the business is called Mercury FX. And they tweeted out today that after being asked if they are still using on-demand liquidity, you can see Winston here, Winston Buki asked, are you guys still using the on-demand liquidity through XRP? We sure are, and some exciting news to come. This is why I'm in the space, everybody. All right, we are jumping yeah, to the fluff. So the person who ran that uh, channel that just had 255 views and had the podcast with David uh, way back when, 2015, so it's like five, five years ago. Wow, unbelievable. This is what he's up to now. He is still writing music and he is um, doing a lot of really good folk music. I love his voice and I love his style. And I just, in listening to his work, um, which I'll put a link down in the description below, I hope he gets a lot of fans because he's doing a lot of, well, there's so much, there are so many good musicians and so uh, the music that comes out of Nashville is really fabulous. So I'm not surprised that he is in Nashville. Um, but it reminded me that I thought I would introduce to you some very famous traditional folk song music from Japan. And yeah, he calls himself now a folk artist. He uploaded this just 15 days ago. So he's still quite active, just not keeping up his um, channel. But he is tweeting. I did find him on uh, Twitter and he is tweeting. So the first music I want to introduce you to, there's an important detail to understand, and that is that it comes from the north. And the north area uses a sugaru shamisen in their music and it's very distinct the sound is full it has energy uh, i think a lot of you know i love it because i've covered this instrument in some unrelated topics but i just love this japanese instrument and it's very specific to the north part of japan which has a very well it has a tradition for being a very tough place to live, not only because of weather, but of course, it's a, a place that's not so easy to um, grow crops because of the weather. And also it is strong in fishing, but you know, whenever you have rough seas and, and really violent weather, um, that's a really very difficult job. So I want you to hear just 20 seconds of this so you can feel this hard, fast, deliberate driving instrument. Here we go. I have a hard time stopping it because she is really a skilled player. She's very good. You play with the bachi down below. It's only um, three strings and you also use your top fingers to also, uh, you know, pluck the sound. It's, it's a, I, I have a couple of shamisen. It's not an easy instrument to play at all. And I just have a lot of respect for people who have achieved a skill like this. Okay, so the music that I'm going to introduce you to uh, uses this instrument. And it is all part of a traditional song that the herring fishermen used because they would go to the north uh, during the spring and they would fish the Sea of Japan. This is in the Hokkaido area, and it has been ever since the mid 1600s that the migrant fishermen from various parts of Japan would find work up there, and they still do, and they work as a team uh, on a boat 
maybe something that you still see from the United States in Alaska when people go up and get on a crab boat or they get on a salmon boat. Um, same sort of deal in Japan. The boats are much smaller, but um, people are still moving up there for that season from March to May. And uh, this photo is of a preserved dormitory in Hokkaido where the fishermen actually slept over the last couple hundred years. You can see the portion we're looking at has eight people can fit in this space. So you are literally shoulder to shoulder. So the song I want to introduce to you is a working song. And it is sung now by every child in Japan in their um, school age because it's just, you know, it's just that much part of the culture. And kids love to sing it because it has a element like hula because the um, choreography that goes with the song actually is telling the story of what the fishermen are doing at that time. And it's just so great. And this is a very modern version with some professional um, professional musicians and professional singer who I'm just going to have you just listen to what, 20 seconds at the most. I want you to get a feel for this working song. It's called Saran Saran and it'll, yeah, put you in the mood and you can really feel how the fishermen were uh, feeling when they would set those nets because it was a really demanding job, cold, wet, long hours. And so this gave them that power. That'll give you, that'll get you up out of bed in the morning to hit the water. So what I thought would be fun for you to know also is that the uh, staple singers back in 1969 actually did this version of the traditional folk song and there's that this album is so great you know it has uh, everyday people which was written by sly stone which is one of my favorites ever but i just find it fascinating that it traveled all the way and made it on an album in 1969 by the staple singers and the one video that i found for you that is a must see video, but I, I don't want to play it here is of a school that is performing. And if you can check it out in the description below, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. I think that in this video, there must be 150 kids doing it and they are into it. And you'll be able to quickly see why it is a favorite here in Japan. All right, everybody, do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.